All right, thanks for having us. And um, so my name's uh, Keith, and this is Tanya. So um, we'd like to talk to you about um, a journey that we've been on over the last year, uh, building a card generator. Um, and it's uh, um, we wanted to focus on um, anybody who's learning Elixir, and, and hopefully we wanted to pull out some of the interesting things that we found as we were building this project that might be useful for you if you're building your project. Sorry. Okay, before we start uh, uh, going into uh, building a card generator, let's uh, warm up a little bit. Uh, to get an idea of what it is we are building, uh, here is a card with a question. Uh, please shout out the answer if you know what it is. Anyone? Give you some time. It's not the easiest card I've picked up. <laughs> this is going to return. Hey. Next one. Anyone? Nothing. It's uh, very interesting if you read it. Drop everyone, so it's dropping everything it has. Okay, empty list. Next one, is it going to be true or false? <laughs> true. <laughs> Next one. Error. Or a string. Oh. <laughs> a couple more. <coughs> Out of bounds error. This is something you just have to know. It's no way you could guess. <laughs> Any That's idea what this might do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> True or false? Yeah, okay. false. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the idea. This is what we wanted to build. Um, those are the actual physical cards. You could see them here, but we needed a way to produce them uh, in a in a way that uh, we could have a nice printed version very easily. Okay, so any journey starts with the first step, and uh, ours started a long time ago. Um, so this is Tanya back in uh, 2015 at our second meetup. We started our, our own Elixir meetup in Southampton in the UK. And um, as you can see, she wrote lots of little post-it notes. So as she was learning Elixir, um, reading the books, she was just writing these little post-it notes down and then collecting them together. And um, on, on one side would be the question and on, on the other side was the answer. And um, I, I didn't have time for that, but, um, but then she, she'd test me. She'd show me these little questions like this. And then I started to realize that, oh, actually, those are pretty good. Those are really quite helpful, because I have a terrible memory. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a terrible memory, but if you do, then these things actually really help. So... Uh, there is a little problem with those post-it notes, my handwriting. Whenever I show it to someone, they spend ages reading the card, and uh, usually the answer comes faster than actually parsing whatever this is. So then Keith suggested that um, instead of writing all of this, it would be good to have a, um, a printed card, it's a printed version which is very easy to read. Okay, this is good, and this was the first uh, point when we had to make a choice. And every journey, um, as um, like a developer journey, and we see this as a journey from idea to a product, um, it uh, starts somewhere, like if you think if we are walking somewhere from, from the right to the left to like this house, you could see that to get from one point to another, you could take any path to get to that point. And by the way, this is the map of St. Augustine, so this is quite a useful slide for us if we want to go somewhere later to discover new things. Okay. Okay, so the first steps towards actually making this, uh, taking it from a, um, a load of post-it notes to actual printed um, cards. Uh, Tanya didn't know anything about printing, the print process or whatever, uh, but she was very determined. So her first attempts at this was to produce 
um, using a package called Inkscape, which is a, a, a vector drawing application to literally create 18 cards on an A3 piece of paper um, and make each card manually. And um, I tried many times to convince her that this might not be the most efficient way to do it, but um, she was very determined. Yeah, until the point when I, uh, I create this uh, uh, layout and I give it to printers and they're like, okay, this is looking fine, but instead of five millimeters gap, it should be two millimeters. I was like, okay, fine, so I have to go, bo go back and change all of this. And soon it become a very, very painful process. So eventually uh, I managed to convince her to stop crying and let's automate uh, all the things. And really, that's where the first idea of actually having a card generator was born. So our first steps towards doing that, we had Inkscape, it had the cards. Um, so with a bit of Googling, I kind of thought, well, there, there must be some kind of mail merge thing that we could do. So Googling around, um, the first thing I found was, of course, there's a gem for that. <laughs> It was pretty horrific, though, because you had to put some uh, percent uh, marks in your Inkscape file, and then um, the Ruby gem, I wrote a bash script which would use the Ruby gem to then drive Inkscape. So it worked, but it was um, very slow and very painful. Um, so I ended up deciding to rewrite it in Python. I just happened to be learning Python at the time. So rewrote it in Python. And we realized that rather than generating um, a PDF, we could generate just pure HTML, and then eventually we could, when we sent it to the printer, we could uh, convert it to uh, PDF from HTML. And that worked. That sped the whole process up. Um, and from that process, we, we ended up uh, deciding that if we put the uh, CSV file that we had, we put it onto Google Spreadsheets, then we could update that. We could end up with multiple packs of, um, of cards. Um, so we needed to download the spreadsheet. We then needed to convert that to HTML, and we could then send that off to the printers. So we kind of developed our process. Oops, sorry. So here, we, uh, the original uh, setup was, was taking a spreadsheet, using Ruby and Inkscape to convert a PDF, but that was hugely slow. Um, so the next stage was, was improving it and removing some of the technologies, taking the CSV, using Python, and creating HTML. But you may have noticed that uh, this is an Elixir conference, and here we are. Uh, learning Elixir. <laughs> here we are trying to learn Elixir and using everything but Elixir <laughs> to build this silly thing. So, but what we did find, we, we helped, uh, this process helped us to identify what uh, might, our application might need to, to achieve. So we worked out that um, generating the CSV, that was, that was useful, that was working. And putting it into Google Spreadsheets meant that we didn't need to worry about building some UI for editing the cards and stuff, so that helped. Um, generating the HTML was working because um, generating PDFs is actually quite slow. So we could generate HTML. Once we were happy with everything, we could then convert it to uh, a PDF before we sent it off to the printers. Um, and then obviously, as I've mentioned, uh, using everything but Elixir wasn't, wasn't quite what we wanted to do. So we, we, uh, we set about building it in, in Elixir. <coughs> And it was important uh, to uh, have a way to test uh, the, the code snippets. Um, there, is a, there is a potential that when you type code, and in, like we keep it in the Google spreadsheet at, at the time, uh, that you made a mistake and then you send it to printers and then you find out that whatever, whatever your code is uh, going to say is going to return is not actually returning that. So we needed a way to test this. So things we wanted uh, to have and we wanted uh, to make sure that Elixir is going to help us with is we wanted to test cards, we wanted to be fast, we wanted to be stable, reliable, and we wanted to be scalable. So Elixir, this is, uh, this is the beginning of uh, my favorite chapter. With Elixir we get a uh, tests with a little bit of metaprogramming, dynamically generated tests. Um, it's fast, uh, we use concurrency, it's reliable uh, if we use uh, supervision, and it's scalable. Uh, we don't uh, do anything with the 
um, right in a scalable application just yet, but we want it for the future, so it's good to have it there. Okay, let's get started. So knowing that uh, those are the steps, uh, we need to download, at the moment, all of the data lives in the Google spreadsheet. Okay, so the first step is to download it. Other one is to test, and another one is convert to compile. You see that uh, it's in pencil because we keep uh, changing the name. We still don't know what is the best name for it. Uh, so we call it compile or, or convert. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the downloader module. So really all we needed to do was download a file from uh, Google, from a URL, from Google Spreadsheet, uh, and then save that to a location on the file system. So what could go wrong with this? Well, doesn't, doesn't, seem, doesn't seem that complicated, does it? So what we're doing, we're using HTT Potion to uh, get the URL, and then we're going to get the body out of that. But if we're given an invalid URL, then that get, that map.get is just going to return nil, and we're going to end up saving nil to a file, which is no use to anyone. So what we can do, we can pattern match on the result of the get. So we'll add that to a case statement. Um, and then we'll pattern match on the re response. So if we get a response, we'll then save that contents to the file. If we get an error, then we'll just pluck the error out and we'll return that to our caller. That seems to make sense. So, okay, we'll look at the save. So, if we're going to save a file, we're going to be given some content, we're going to open the file path, or we'll open a file handler, um, we'll write the contents of the, the, the contents that we're given, we'll write that to the file, and then we'll close the file handler. Seems pretty simple. So what could go wrong here? Okay, well, if we look in IEX at file.open, uh, we can see that the file could not be opened. So then in that instance, we'll get a tuple back with error and a reason. So, okay, here you'll see when we open the file, we're not, we're not, gonna, we're not pattern matching for that case. So we're actually going to end up uh, crashing our caller because we're with a match error. So we'll get this nice uh, match error, which, you know, we want to try and avoid that. The uh, Erlang philosophy of let it crash doesn't mean just don't handle errors. So it would be nice if we didn't crash on there. Uh, so if we handled that, so now we're going to, in our save file, we're going to open it and we'll check and we'll pattern match on the result. If we get a file, then we're going to go ahead and write, to the, write the contents to the file and then close it. If we get an error, then we'll pattern match the error and then we'll res respond with that. What about the... Oops, sorry. What about that bin write? So is that going to error? Are we going to get a problem there? Well, if we have a look in um, IEX this time, it doesn't actually tell us. Uh, what the response is. So if anyone's looking for uh, contributions to Elixir, that might be a good spot. Um, if you look at the source code for bin write, though, we'll see that um, if we look at the spec here, I'm sorry if you can't see that at the back, um, it will return OK or an error and, um, and a term. So we know that it's possible it could error. So let's pattern match on that as well. OK, so now we're opening the file. If we're OK, we're then... Uh, pattern matching on whether we can write to the file. If that's okay, then we close the file. Otherwise, we return the error. That's great, but there's a problem here. Can anyone spot it? So in our, in our error um, case here, we're not actually closing the file. So let's fix that. So now if we've now got file closed on both sides. Um, so that's great. So, um, oh, sorry, we'll just check. So what about this file close? Do we think that might cause an error as well? Um, surely not, but we'll have a look. Um, if you look in IEX, it mostly returns OK, except for some severe errors, such as <laughs> out of memory. Hmm. OK, we'll check the um, spec for that as well. OK, so yes, it definitely could return with an error. Um, to be honest, if we get this kind of error, we've probably got bigger problems to deal with. So today, right now, we're going to stop there. So we'll go back to our beautiful little monster here, this save function. So if you look around you, 
You can probably see the seasoned uh, Elixir developers, they'll be fidgeting in their seats looking at this code, feeling quite uncomfortable. But before we dive in and refactor it though, let's consider what the spec of this function might look like. We need to understand what the return types are, um, might be. So if we look here, we're returning from the file close, we're returning an OK or a tuple error. If we look here, uh, just below the reason, we're only returning the result of the reason. We're not returning a tuple. Um, and then at the bottom there, again, we're plucking out the reason. So if we look here, our spec right now is going to look like OK or term. But it's far more idiomatic for Elixir to return either OK or an error, a tuple with the error atom in there so that you can pattern match. So if we update our function to, uh, to respond in that way, then here we're now uh, matching the, the whole error and just returning that in both cases. Um, and then from our caller's perspective, they can now pattern match on, on the error tuple um, and if they want to do something with it. But maybe we could even take this principle and pass our error even further back up the chain. So then our download now looks like this, where we're basically returning the result of the save, uh, which could be an error tuple or um, the error from the uh, HTTP potion. OK, so we'll go back to our save function. I haven't forgotten that we've got that little mess there. So the issue with this is where is the happy case? So if you look here, we're opening the file successfully. Here, we're successfully writing to the file. And then finally, we're closing the file. So this code doesn't make me happy. It's very hard to discern from from all of the noise, the complexity of handling errors is difficult to discern the intent of the code. So perhaps there's a better way. Use the force, Luke. <laughs> so the kernel.with special form is designed for this kind of situation. So we can rewrite our code uh, using the with. So if we rewrite it using with, we'll start our function with with OK. And we're back to having the, the explicit calls that we started with file.open, file, uh, bin, io.binwrite, and file.close. If each one of those returns successfully, um, we'll then if it, we'll drop into the do, and that's where our happy case will return. If for any reason one of those um, calls uh, responds with an error, then the error will pop out the bottom. So it's now quite clear when you look at that function uh, what the intent of the code is. Now, the thing with this is there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So for completeness, I'd like to demonstrate some of the other ways that you could achieve this. So the first way is using within your file open, you could use the try after um, statements. So around the bin write, we, we put the try after block. Um, so the result of the try will be, or the result of the bin write will be what is returned, and the after will always be run. So we know that we'll always close our file. Now you could use the file open uh, th uh, arity3 function, uh, which takes a function. So the, the only issue with this uh, approach is that uh, when you call your bin write, and then do file close, the only thing that's returned is the result of the file close, not the result of the bin write. So if for any reason our attempt to write the file fails, we don't get the result. We don't get that back to our caller. So we can, of course, add a try after block to that so that we ensure that we're actually returning the result of uh, the success of the write back to the caller. So any of you that maybe have some knowledge of Haskell or other strongly typed languages might be sitting there saying, oi, use a monad. And this is, of course, very possible. So if we um, create ourselves a macro here, this, this is the equivalent of the bind operator in Haskell, which will allow us to, to combine uh, uh, operations together. So if you look inside the unquote here, we're going to pattern match on the result of left function. And if that returns us with an OK and a value, we'll then pass the value, the X, 
through to the function as the first argument to the function of the right. If for any reason that, 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 uh, that call fails, it will then drop into the error case and just pass back the expression. So now our save function, using that macro, would look like this. We open a file, we write a file, we close a file. So the thing here that we need to remember is that we need to lift these functions into an either type so that they do respond with a tuple for OK and a value or an error and, and a value. So, for example, the open file, we need to... The open file, we know file.open returns with an OK and a file, so that one's good. Um, but the write file, we need to take the first argument, which is file, and then return with OK and file so that the, the following statements can work. And then close file, we do the same thing there. So they all need to adhere to responding with um, either OK and term or error and term. So for completeness, this is, uh, this is the function that you might want to add to your, your module. Um, and there are libraries that can uh, help you with this, libraries that are attempting to address um, this kind of uh, scenario. So a good one is, is um, written by a guy called Crowdhaler, which is called OK, another one by Rob Brown, uh, Monad X, and there are many more. If you're interested in this kind of approach uh, of dealing with errors, um, I can recommend uh, watching Scott's uh, Railway-Oriented Programming. In fact, any of the talks by, by Scott are really good. He's, he makes very entertaining talks. Anything by Brian Lonsdorf, I can highly recommend. He definitely knows what he's talking about. Um, and generally, learning about monoids, functors, applicatives uh, is, is actually quite interesting and fun and dealing with handling errors in, in this way. Um, Listening to Lambda Cast and Magic Read Along and Functional Geekery will help you to start understanding these things. And of course, listen to Elixir Fountain, but I assume you already are. So now, with all that in place, we should just be able to run from Mix, we should be able to run download um, pack one, and we should be able to get our pack one downloaded. Okay, uh, so in order to run this function, you have to. Um, launch the IEX and then you need to run your, your downloaded or download. And uh, uh, when you quit the IEX and then you launch it again, then you wouldn't have your history saved. And this could be a little bit annoying to retype it. So this is the way you could uh, remember the history. Uh, this is just a, a side tip. Okay, so running it from IEX uh, is, is good, but uh, it would be nicer to just run it uh, uh, from the command line. And mixed task uh, is what uh, doing that. So here we're going to create a, a simple mixed task which is going to help us with this. How many of you have uh, re written mixed task? Okay. <coughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so once uh, people who haven't written, once you, you see how easy it is, I think you write mixed task all the time because this is what I get to, to do. <laughs> okay, so first you need to think how you want to run your mixed task. So this is going to download cards. So I want to run it as mixed cards, download, and then I want to pass uh, parameters, which is going to be a language and the pack I want to download. Okay, great. Um, let's create this. Uh, all we need to do is to use mixed task. Um, if you go to um, uh, documentation, it's, it's uh, have a, a good uh, walk through how to do this. It's just a few lines. So basically, this is all we need. This is the module which is using mixed task, and it needs to have only one f one function run. Uh, and in example, uh, you could see that the, the, it's uh, going to take any parameters, uh, which is good for a catch-all case. So whoever is passing wrong parameters or no parameters or whatever, it's good to have a helpful message to tell them what they need to be doing. Okay, so this is good. And then you want to try to run your task once you compile it. And if you run it, you're going to have uh, your helpful message saying how you should be running this task. Okay, this is good. So uh, you want to see your task, which you created in a list of tasks. You do mix dash h, and your task is not there. You're like, why is that? Why is it not there? Okay, it's not, it's not difficult to fix, so all we need to do is to add a short doc uh, with a nice message uh, saying what the mixed task is going to do. 
and then you have to recompile it again, and if you do mix-h again, you're going to see your task in, uh, in a list of tasks. I'm not really good with uh, following the standards. If you see all of the other mixed tasks, they are starting with the uppercase, and they don't have a dot at the end. <laughs> but uh, after I've added this slide, there was two ways to change it. So, okay, this is a unique task here in the list of the tasks. <laughs> Okay, so that is good, but uh, actually we want our mixed task doing something useful. So let's, call, let's our task call our downloaded or download our function. Uh, all it needs to do is just to say, okay, as I'm going to accept multiple arguments, I'm going, I need to have it in a list, and then I'm going to call my function with those arguments. Okay, this is all good. Um, but. Could you see that there is a potential problem here? What happens if uh, whoever is running the task is going to pass some gibberish and then we are just going to call our download and download with the uh, arguments which are going to possibly cause uh, some problems inside the downloader. So here is our responsibility to make sure that we are not allowing that case. And that's very, very easy to do with the guard clauses. So here we're saying that Okay, if we are ha having a combination of this language and the pack, then okay, we are going to call the function. And you see there is a allowed languages and packed combination, so it's not just separate arguments, they're in a combination. Okay, so this is good. So if we are going to, uh, uh, if we are going to run this task with the correct arguments, we are going to call our function, otherwise we are just going straight into a catch-all case and we are not breaking anything. And as the result, we are going to, uh, we're going to find out that uh, the uh, actual pack is downloaded and that you could, it says where you could find it. Okay, this is good. The next big subject is, okay, how do we test the cart? So I had uh, this uh, functionality of um, ability to test the cards for a long time, and it has happened that um, on a hard day we had uh, uh, James uh, there in the corner soldering away LEDs, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, well, I asked him if he could help me to, to write this, and uh, he kindly agreed to do that. Uh, so here I'm going to show you wh what uh, we did and what I carry on doing. So let's walk through the test. Uh, what we have is the CSV file, which looks like that. It has a question and an answer. And there are different types of uh, questions and an answers. You may have a, a code snippet, which you could run and evaluate and test. And there are like theory questions, which you can't run. So you need to somehow um, filter that. Okay, let's think about how you may want to call this tester. So this is the way I thought it would be nice is that you say, okay, so if I provide this language in the pack, then I want to have all of the tests running. Great. Let's try to create this. So this is just the beginning of this. We are going to just fetch a file knowing the language in the pack. Okay, great, and here we also could uh, use our guard clause uh, for full control to make sure that uh, we only accept arguments which are allowed. Okay, the next thing is to uh, filter out of all of the questions and answers only questions which, are, which we could uh, create tests out of, or code questions. So we are going to do that here, if we look a little bit closer. Uh, so we are going to take all of the questions which are code questions um, and all of the answers and we are going to have them in one chunk. Okay, how do we do that? Let's uh, have a get cold cards function which is going to do all this for us. Okay, so we have a file, CSV file, and we stream it and then we read from that file. Um, there is a nice library uh, Nimble CSV by Jose. It's a, it's a, if you're doing anything with CSVs, this is a good one to, to use. Okay, and then we parse that stream. And the next thing, this may look a bit like strange why we do that. So if you think about it, we have um, a file um, with lots of questions and answers, and uh, each row is 
basically our card number. So we have like a file which contains uh, 54 cards and each card is going to have like number, like ID, like one, two or whatever. And it will be useful if when we have the test failing, not go through the whole file, try to find which one, but have some indication on which one is failing. So here, if we do with the index, uh, what we're going to have as the result, we are going to have a tuple for each one, which is going to contain this uh, a list with the question and answer and a line, which is useful for us when we generate tests. Okay, and uh, out of the stream, we need to get this uh, question and an answer. Okay, so let's do that. Um, this is just an internal like imp implementation detail because I know that answer starts with the hash rocket. I could use the power of pattern matching in a function head to get those um, answers. Uh, and otherwise, I'm just going to return the, an empty list. So here, as the result, I'm going to have um, questions and answers which, which are code questions which I could run. Okay, um, and this is just a function which is going to use the power of regex to take uh, this uh, content of those question and answers. <coughs> okay, so this is our code card. So we filtered them. The next thing is once we filtered those code cards, we need to somehow uh, create or dynamically generate a module which is going to contain all of the tests. Let's have a closer look at this. So here, we have a question and an answer, which are strings in this case, and we need to take them out of this, of, of where, where it is, the, the filtered block. We need to take a question, and we need to somehow turn it into a code. We need to take an answer, and also from a string, turn it into a code, and here we could use uh, our line number, as we have it as a tuple, so we know which card is, is going to fail when we do have that. Okay, so let's do that. How do we do that? Uh, first, define a test module. Okay, if you look at how you create a module, and you need to pass a module, which is an atom, then you need to pass a body, which is whatever goes inside the module, um, an environment. So you may see here, so we have a module, and we have a content, where is body? Okay, let's create a body. If you uh, think of how, you, how you, when you write in tests, and you open a file, and you uh, define the module, and then at the top you uh, write in use x unit case, and then you write in your test. So this is what we are doing here. We are saying, okay, so we use x unit case, and here we need to start writing our tests. But we need the way to generate those tests. We're now writing it manually. Okay, so we need to generate those cases. Uh, we have a content which is uh, um, each uh, element of this content is a tuple which is containing line, question, and an answer. And as uh, as I mentioned, we needed to be a code, uh, and we have strings. So turn strings to a code. There is a method for that. Okay, brilliant. So we have a question and an answer which are uh, quoted. Great, so they're quoted. Then we need to have a, a test also in how the, the quote. Um, here, when I think about quoting and unquoting, it's uh, a little bit like string interpolation where quote is like your string and whatever uh, you, need to, uh, the, you need to get the value out of variable, you put it in this uh, like string interpolation syntax. So here is a little bit similar. You have quote and then you have unquote, which, so you need to take value out of whatever is in your variable. You can't just call it. So here you need to unquote line unquote question and unquote answer and run the assertion. Okay, so those are generated ca cases. Good. <laughs> we define the module dynamically. Uh, this is great. The next thing is to run tests. Okay, so we have a function run. I'm not really good with uh, creating names for modules, so I just call it tested. Um, and this is quite simple. We just Call tests run, and as the result, um, I'll show you here. So if we call this function, 
um, test the test passing the language and the pack. Uh, if the test is failing, we are going to have a, a card which is failing. So if I then go to my uh, data with CSV, I need to go and look at the row six. I then need to then try to find which one is failing, which is quite nice. Um, the actual failure. Uh, and the happy case, when everything is good, looks like this. Great. Okay. <laughs> if you managed to make it through that, well done. <laughs> so we have now successfully downloaded uh, the data for the cards. We've tested the cards to make sure that the, the content is valid and that we're comfortable that uh, the cards that we're about to create are correct. So now we just need to take the contents that are in the CSV and convert that to HTML so that we can then render uh, a PDF ready to send to the printer. So we started, um, render to the printer. So we started with this process um, thinking, oh, it can't be that hard. We'll just, um, we'll just use some regex. So um, we started writing regular expressions, trying to, trying to do some pattern matching, capturing, and then replacing P tags and um, code tags and so on. But it got very quickly, got very difficult, and it was very difficult to test, uh, especially once you start getting into recursive regular expressions. I don't recommend that. Um, and so we ended up ch changing tact quite, uh, it took a bit of pain before we sort of realized that we were going in the wrong direction with this. And we broke it apart into um, three pieces, which is a tried and tested method. Uh, breaking it into a tokenizer, a parser, and a compiler. And the advantage of doing that was that we broke this problem into small chunks, which we could then test. And I can't recommend that in whatever language you're ever using. Just write small things, it works. So the tokenizer is basically going to take a string and chop that into a list of tokens. The parser is going to convert that list of tokens into a tree. And then the tree, uh, the compiler is going to take that tree and turn it into HTML. We could have different, different compilers for different uh, output formats. And then the card at the end here is just the template that we're going to use. So here we're taking in a string. The tokenizer is going to take a string and then just return us a list of tuples. Um, the parser will take a list of tuples and turn that into uh, an AST. Uh, and it's a very simple AST. We, we, um, deliberately chose it as simple as possible. Um, and you know, we, can, we can increase this complexity from there, but we've, we were able to test it in isolation, which made it very easy to write and then very easy to test. Um, and then finally, the compiler would take that tree and spit out some HTML. And then, of course, Tanya loves mixed tasks. I'm not going to explain you how to write second mixed task. I just say that this is great to create mixed tasks for everything. <laughs> So we've now kind of recreated what we had in uh, Python and then previously in Ruby uh, in Elixir, just the pieces. Um, and what we actually did was do them as individual applications. So they could then be, uh, they could have their own little test suite, they could be run individually, they could be, um, if we chose, they could be replaced at, at you know, if we, if we chose to do it differently. Um, and the first one we decided, okay, well, this is Elixir, so we should be able to use uh, concurrency to improve the performance if we're downloading a file. So, do you want to talk about Yeah, sure. Uh, so, how, how difficult it is. So, we used, uh, b before we go and, and do something with concurrency, we thought we want to uh, see how fast we are going to do concurrently. So, we used this bench for our, our benchmark library, and uh, the setup is quite easy. We have a not concurrent and concurrent downloader. And those functions are um, pretty much simple. Uh, and quite similar to each other. One, uh, so they both grabbing uh, packs from 1 to 20 and downloading. Uh, not concurrent, do it sequentially, and concurrent, the only difference is that it's spawning the pro This is the, the simplest way to do concurrency, just spawn the process and, and call this function within the process. And then we run this, and we get the result. Like, wow, look at this. This is way faster. We should do everything concurrently forever. <laughs> and then we thought, OK, let's see how it looks on the graph. So if you see on the left, this is concurrent. You can't even see it. And there is 
sequential. So we thought, wow, this is, this is really good. Okay, and with this, we've done our uh, three pieces. We have something working. Uh, we uh, still have a lot to go, and we have a lot of plans and ideas, and we want to, of course, do all, everything concurrently from now on. <laughs> Uh, it will be good to have, uh, like at the moment, we have uh, like separate pieces, uh, like downloaded test, and we could run them with uh, mixed tasks. But it will be good to have some kind of pipeline when you go from one end to another. Uh, it will also be good to have some kind of like state machine or some process uh, which is going to keep a state of uh, of each park. And uh, it would be good to have some UI to manage things. And uh, keeping data in spreadsheet doesn't feel quite right. So we want them to have to move it into a database. And yeah, so at the moment, I mean, we kind of made the decision that, that uh, using the spreadsheet was, was working for us. Um, and and it, it was good enough for us to grow. But uh, obviously, what we'd like to do is have our own UI. But by choosing to use Google Spreadsheets meant we didn't have to go ahead and build some uh, UI that we didn't, didn't uh, have time to. So we could focus on the important parts of actually creating a pack of cards that we could print. Um, now that we've got these packs of cards, um, we can actually think, OK, well, do, we don't want to use Google Spreadsheets anymore. We want to create our own admin UI. And because we've built this as um, using uh, OTP apps, using an umbrella apps, we can just add in another web app, whether it's Phoenix or another you know, web layer. Um, and then again, for different um, public UIs, we're thinking uh, we can introduce multiplayer games where people can play. And that can all plug into the same system as individual little apps. And that's really what uh, the apps gives us. Um. Our journey was fun. Um, Johnny caught us somewhere like in the beginning of our journey and said, okay, come on, come and tell us. So this is where we're at at the moment. Um, and to summarize uh, what we talked about, it's, uh, uh, it's a lot of ways to handle errors and a lot of questions whether you should or shouldn't handle errors. Um, mixed tasks are easy and fun. Uh, uh, dynamically generating tests uh, are interesting learning and it's very useful. Concurrency is uh, you, when you use things, when you do things concurrently, you gain a lot. And starting small, writing small functions, and then keep growing and keep building up. Uh, this is what worked for us. And this is our journey in the, in the picture. And I don't think we have any time for questions. So uh, whoever is going to distillery, you could ask all the <laughs> questions there or at the lunch um, or tomorrow, today, any time after, after now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>